Hello and welcome back to another live session here from Graph UK HQ. We're in the video studio with another edition of Stormwater School Live with our resident uh, stormwater expert, Lisa. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, Callum. How are you? Um, nice Very to good, thank you. I am in mood today. Good. Uh, Spurs won last night against Fulham at Craven Cottage. Kane is now one goal away from breaking the all-time goal scoring record, and I'm in a much better mood. Yeah, well, I'm happy. Happy you're happy. Thanks, and I'm happy you're happy too, because uh, your hometown, Naples, they're doing very well at Syria. Yes, they are. They've been doing. They've really been outstanding all you know all year. They've been setting the standard, pretty much like Graf. Um, and yeah, they're at the top at the minute and looking good in the Champions League as well. So. Fingers crossed. Yes, I mean, they are looking exceptional. They had a very big win over Juventus. Uh, was it 5 1 in the end? Um, I think it was, yeah. I mean, Juventus have also not been anywhere near their peak the last season, but they're still a, still a classy team, you know. Um, but yeah, that's quite, it's uh, looking quite positive. As long as they can do, I mean, if they just, Italy have obviously not been doing so well in the international competitions this year, so I'm pinning my hopes. Um, on... We did win the Euros. Uh, last yes we did I'll never forget that evening what a wonderful night but um, oh yeah Flavia um bless her was on a maternity leave she didn't message me at all um when she was off it but she did message me once Italy beat England in the final um and if I'd have had your personal number I would have done the exact same but there's a reason you probably well, don't give it to me <laughs> that's it for today's live session then folks <laughs> right right We'll get cracking with today's session. One thing you will notice is that as we keep improving, constantly improving, I've got cue cards. That's the one thing I've invested in. I saw it on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of It, so I thought, you know what, I need cue cards. Um, you can't believe yourself, I was going to say. Like, you should have, I wish I'd have known that that was allowed. Yeah, uh, well, I do make notes, but I usually have a notepad in front of me, and sometimes on the screen you can see it. So I thought, what is more slick professional than cue cards? I thought that is just one little addition that people may notice. Plus, I've had a lot of complaints about me moving my hands too much. Um, so I'm hoping that with something central I can hold on to, I don't use my hands as much. Obviously, you're Italian in spirit then as well. Yeah, that must be it. I mean, when we go on to attenuation tanks and I'm just like that all the time. Um, <laughs> Mamma mia, attenuation tanks. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So Right. Okay. We're digressing. Okay. We're digressing and we'll get back onto track. So, the main topic um, that we'll be discussing in today's Stormwater School mm. is what are attenuation tanks used for? Um, mm. So, part of it is um, suds, which is kind of uh, most sites have to adhere to, stopping the flow of stormwater landing on permeable surfaces and flowing and potentially flooding um, lo uh, of environments locally. I mean, that's the main crux, but Lisa, our expert, is going to get into more detail about it. So, Lisa, take us away. What are attenuation tanks used for? Um, I said there's like kind of there's the really kind of top level simple answer is that they're a storage tank which is used to allow um, water to discharge at a controlled rate. Um, you know, when you build on something, I said that you know, you create a heavier runoff essentially, you know, your water is now landing on a hard surface before it would have landed on a permeable surface. And so it's going to travel at a much faster rate, which um, is going to, you know, maximise flood risk, essentially, because the water is nowhere to go. So an attenuation tank creates a break almost, which allows that water to gather underground and build up behind. So essentially it flows in faster than it flows out. It creates like a kind of underground reservoir, essentially, um, and, you know, allows the water to hold the water in and allows it to discharge more slowly into the sewage systems, the, the storm sewage systems, at the rate that it would have done more similarly before um, the development took place. Um, so it's used really, um, so it, it's basically a holding tank, um, but it is really quite an important part of any drainage design, of any development design, um, because again, there's no point in building some lovely new houses, factories, etc., that are going to then, you know, become prone to, to flood and you know money loss and um, you know just be prone be prone to be not very pleasant places to live or work um, because they're constantly at flood risk. So um, the, the the tanks are obviously formed from crate systems. There is other ways to do attenuation tank we, tanks. We specialise in crate systems and uh, wrapped in a permeable membrane um, to create them to make them essentially watertight storage 
um, tanks, and they can be designed to any particular size shape, which is the really the big, the big draw of them. Um, so that is what they are basically. They're underground storage facilities um, to mimic to, to, to help to mimic as part of a larger suds design um, a more natural flow of water into um, sometimes are quite old um, sewage um, storm sewage systems which were um, put in place well before the rate of development that we have right now. I think you summed that quite well. And um, with attenuation tanks, their job is very similar to soak away. However, in how they work is two different sim uh, two different ways. Yeah, I mean that's that soak away is the same. It's also a, an underground holding tank facility. But the difference is that the soil in this particular development has been tested um, and can still um, accept um, stormwater back into the soil. Um, you know, the, the, it's permeable. Obviously, in the UK and, and across the world, there are many different types of soil. There's sandy fine soils, there's heavy clay soils. Um, you know, they, I mean, sometimes even over a, a small area, you can have a very, very different geology. And where the attenuation tank, tank or soapway tank is going, generally um, the, there will have been a ground investigation. Some boreholes will have been taken and the soil type will have been um, tested. Because a soakaway is always preferable. Soakaways obviously really take the um, the old sewer system, storm sewer system, out of the equation. The water from the tank will not um, make its way into the main pipe network, um, you know, past the development. Um, and they also help to replenish your groundwater um, as well. Soakaways more naturally. Um, so soakaway tanks are also a holding facility. They're wrapped in a different material. Rather than being wrapped in per imper impermeable material, they're wrapped in a permeable material which will allow the water to build up inside um, and hold. It's a textile like this, which is quite thin, um, but it will still allow the water to build up, but then naturally make its way through the sides and bottom of the tank. Soak, soaking away, really, it does what it says in the tin. Um, you know, soaking, right, so there will be generally no outlet, so the water isn't going out of the tank. The tank is its final destination, essentially, and then it will um, permeate back through into the soil naturally. But they're both holding facilities. It's just the way that the water is discharged from them is very different. Perfect. I think you summed that up very well. And as you said, it's both to, or both jobs, especially attenuation tanks, as was the question, is to withhold um, excess rainwater during a storm event and then release it at a more natural rate. That's um, if the building wasn't there, um, that's how the water would go about infiltrating into the soil um, in a more natural uh, way. Exactly, yeah. Perfect. Great. That is um, well rounded up to the main topic. Lisa, uh, you were excellent in your answers once again. Uh, as were you, Callum, with your questions. Thank you. I pride myself on my question, answer, uh, question asking these days. That's why you're on the coach. Yes, exactly. Right, now we're moving on to my <clears throat> new favourite topic. This is new this year, and if you've watched any of the past uh, live sessions, so rainwater research and wastewater wisdom, we've had the in the news section. Um, so we've got a couple of news stories that we'd like to show you. Uh, the first one um, is a bit uh, self-gloating. It is Graph UK supporting uh, BMW Hams Hall factory. We'll have uh, the story up on your screen now. And as you can see, Lisa, you might know more about this than me. I say might, you will know more about this than me. Do you want to take it away from here? Um, yeah, so just again, another project we're really proud of. And obviously, if any of our local viewers do have time, we'd say to go and have a quick look through this article. Um, it was a fantastic, it's a, it's a plant in Warwickshire, um, which um, makes the BMW and Mini engines um, great, also British manufacturing um, Mini, which is now, you know, the engines are, are are created in Warwickshire and BMW are now part of the same group. Um, and we, um, they basically are so bu we're so busy at the moment, they make these next generation engines, it's such a demand product that they really had to put some kind of expansion um, on their factory. Um, this contract was awarded to a, a ground worker who we'd worked with extensively before, so we really were um, you know, forefront in their minds as well to, to help them in the next project because they were very happy with their service before. Um, so the expansion facilities, they want to take on more people, um, you know, and just create bigger manufacturing, meant that they had they, they would need an extended attenuation system, potentially a bigger, um, another new attenuation system to cope with the new development. So we um, designed this tank. Uh, the final tank size was 1,254 metres cubed, so a really, really big tank, which again gives you some indication of the size of the facility that they mm. are expanding. 
Um, we looked at the design. Um, it was designed at a meter. Um, you know, the, the, the drone we got meant that the tank was um, a bit, was designed at a meter high. To work with the Graph pro, uh, product, the Graph Max, we made the tank at 1.09, which obviously because we're slightly deeper, we could reduce the footprint. Um, and also, I think we've mentioned in previous sessions that um, EcoBlock Max is, um, has a higher void ratio at 96% than the majority of the creek systems in the market. So essentially, we could hold the same volume of water um, in less crates. So the, these two factors combined, a slightly deeper tank with the extended void ratio, meant that we could actually reduce the size of the dig um, on this one by 75 metres squared, which is no small, you know, that's no small area, essentially. That saves money not for the contractor. First of all, on crates, I said, because we hold more water per crate than others. It saved on excavation size, so less loads, um, you know, of spoil we have to take away from site. Less lorries coming on to site, um, you know, less time for the equipment, less time to dig out as well. And so it's all cost. So the cost saving not only on the fantastically good value product we provide, but cost saving, um, you know, on site time as well. Um, again, the stackable design of EcoBlock Max meant we were only five lorry loads. This has been almost four times as many in a traditional block crate system and um, so another huge advantage for the customer and um, also in terms of the design you can imagine with it being a fact as we've mentioned before like a factory and the type of product that had to cope with heavy duty traffic loadings so we designed the tank as such um, to take hgv loadings um, and also the um it was, it was maintenance was important and um, so they wanted this tank to have an inspectable um, and maintainable um, design as well, so we incorporated a row of eco block flex inspect within it um, to allow really easy jet and maintenance um, going forward. So really, the the product was just really worked fantastically well for the application. Um, you know, certainly large tanks and um, graph can really really make big cost savings, especially obviously we're good value for any size tank, but because of our high boy ratio, the the larger tanks get, the more uh, crates you can save essentially. Um, to hold the same amount of water because of a high void ratio. So it really, really was a, a fantastic project that we're happy to be involved in. And we're already working with that same contractor on some more, and we have done since, so we're really, really chuffed about that. Um, we've excelled ourselves again, if we don't say so ourselves. Yes. And that is a fascinating product. <clears throat> no, project, sorry. sorry. Lisa, you've touched on it earlier with the high void ratio of the product. Not only is it the case of uh, reducing probably the amount of crates actually used, uh, especially when it comes to bigger projects. But also the fact that because it's stackable, you can save uh, lorries going to site, which is going to save you emissions and costs. You're then also looking at the costs and emissions created by the lorries coming to the site to take spoil away. And because yeah. of the less wood ratio and saving so much space, it, there's like these overall reductions, not only in potentially cost, but also the environmental impact that the crate has, kind of, especially with these larger projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, the stackable design of what match really is um, a fantastic feature. I mean, really, people don't realise quite how much it saves. Essentially, when you think about a traditional kind of box crate or a block crate, mm. um, when we say they have 95% void ratio, you're transporting 95% empty space or air, empty air. Um, you know, your lorry is filled with 95% space and 5% plastic, essentially, um, which you can imagine, it's just, it's just not efficient. Um, and the design meaning that, you know, the, ta the crates are packed incredibly tightly together, um, essentially inside one another means that, that you just take that away. We, you know, our lorries are filled with product um, and we massively reduce the number of um, loads required. As I said, actually it was something I was doing some training with some new people yesterday when we were going through a presentation and it just reminded me again how many, uh, how good it is. Um, a traditional crate, you get approximately 90 metres cubed on a lorry with equal block matching at 395 meters cubed um on one vehicle so that is four times um as much product to one load which um you know and it's also i mean time on site offloading and loading time even putting piles of crates in into an excavation because we still do support from the site when we get and drive to install we didn't provide us with you know a machine and driver to help us load crates into the excavation for um, our guys to put them in um, and if you're, you know, the just it's just all time that um, we can get so many more crates in a pallet, which means they don't need to feed us with crates quite so quickly. They're still at a reasonable rate, of course. 
Um, so it just really helps. It helps all around, to be honest. That's one. I mean, that's probably our best news story yet to put in the news section. Uh, there's nothing that's going to beat this or beat that one. Sorry. But I think this next one might. Um, we'll just have it on the screen. So this um, has gone, I would say, quite under the radar. I certainly didn't um, realize until I was researching. But there's been a slight change, or what could be changing um, in 2024, a new approach when it comes to sub systems. Obviously, the Stormwater Management Act come out, come out in 2010, so it's been about 12 to 13 years now since there's been any new developments with it. But in a recent uh, government review, they find that or sub sustainable uh, drainage systems, or SUD, um, could be incorporated into every new development in England um, from 2024. I think this was a case of a review that happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I think now they're going to look to investigate it and potentially bring out 2024. This is quite an interesting um, news story, Lisa. Yes, it really is. Um, I mean, the SUDS, as you said, has been around. SUDS has been something that's been essentially a buzzword in drainage uh, for quite a while now. But it is still just a recommendation. Um, Wales is actually the only of the UK which um, has SUDS as law, that SUDS must be caught in every new development. Um, of course, Scotland, England and Northern Ireland, um, because we all have our own water bodies. Um, SUDS is a recommendation, obviously, you know, highly um, strenuously recommended, but it is still a recommendation. Um, but Rebecca Power, Environmental Minister, has also been looking at this in the background and they recently kind of published a review on the 10th of January to say that they were, um, they are seriously considering making SUDS a mandatory, um, you know, mandatory requirement in England, which has really no disadvantages that, that certainly we can think of. Um, environmental issues are forefront, um, you know, at the minute for obviously for, for most companies and obviously for the government as well. Um, and because SUDS is not just about dealing with the water, the excess water, which we used to be the traditional kind of approach, essentially, was just what do we do with this water, um, you know, that's created by this development. Whereas SUDS is a holistic approach. It's just not, what well, did you not just how do we deal with the water quantity, but how do we ensure that water quality is of the same quality it would have been when it reaches our rivers and streams as if this development wasn't here. How do we sustain this long term so it doesn't affect the wildlife plants and people who are going to live in the area? So it's a much more holistic approach and a much more environmental approach than just, you know, let's get rid of this excess water that, that comes. Um, and, you know, it's it's creating nicer spaces for people as well. Um, so it's incorporating things like, you know, trees and, um, you know, some natural elements into your drainage design as well, which will naturally, um, you know, take up some of the water. It's incorporating, um, you know, things like um, safe, um, you know, ponds, wetlands, which again are all part of such design. They don't um, replace or create systems, certainly, but they are as an overall approach. It's like, how do we not just put in a create system, but how do we create, put in an entire system, which is going to um, work long term and, um, and, say, and, and creates the quality. How do we clean this water before we put it back? to um, the rivers and plants. So the fact that SUDS becomes mandatory in England, um, you know, it's only going to have a fantastic impact um, on, you know, the, the the water sources, the water courses of England. And it's uh, it, there is a public public consultation scheduled for later in the year. As this is still just a recommend this is still just under consultation at the moment. And um, that this become mandatory in twenty twenty four, but it really is looking very, very positive at the moment that this is going to be um law. Um, in a few years, which, as I said, is fantastic for the industry and fantastic for the people and fantastic for the people of England that live in the country and that want to enjoy their beautiful country for years to come. Mm. And I think that you've um, summed up really well there. It's at the very start, so this was very much just, we've got this excess water, how do we deal with it? And it was very much just uh, ponds, um, you know, yeah, like attenuation ponds, large lakes, and for the water just to kind of run off into. And at that point, it's like, well, we've dealt with the excess. But it was kind of the step on that's kind of led to this, I think, review consultation. And I think most likely potential change in 2024. And that is the water in kind of it, with it trying to mimic the natural water cycle. When water vapor goes up to the clouds and it starts to rain, it, it will pick up um, particles, carbon and nutrients in the atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. So that when it does rain, um, Whereas, like, kind of naturally before, before you know, we were building 
shopping centers and car parks, they would literally fall on these grasslands and the actual uh, grass, plants, trees would take up those nutrients that come, that, you know, come down with the rainfall that then soaks up the water then makes its way into streams and rivers and then the water cycle begins. But then because we put obviously developments in place such as factories, industrial estates, uh, car parks, roads, you name it, it means that there's not grass and these natural wetlands or trees to take up these nutrients. So these particles still make their way into the water courses, which kind of tampers with the water cycle. And not only is it dealing with the excess water, it's actually treating it to remove these particles from it that could harm the water cycle further down the line. Yeah, exactly. And also things like um, well, the one that kind of gets missed that should design really take into consideration is um, um, riverbed erosion. You have to mm. think about how quickly the um, the water is able to be running off now compared to what it was. And it's going into the sewer system, the storm sewer system, with no attenuation tank in place or with no other, you know, um, with no runoff being dealt with in other ways, such as through rainwater harvesting or through evapotranspiration of plants or through attenuation to slow it down. Um, even if the sewer, the pipes themselves can cope with the excess runoff, that water will be flowing at such a massive rate compared to what it was before that it actually creates riverbed erosion, um, you know, stripping the nutrients that are already there, um, which are, you know, and washing them out to sea, essentially. So it really is important to slow that water down, to deal with it, and to make sure it's as clean as possible before it reaches them. Um, because otherwise, you know, the, I think, again, that we're only now becoming much more environmentally conscious as a nation, as a people. And we're really thinking about our impact. Um, and, you know, all these things are essentially coming, light, coming to light, becoming the forefront in minds of designers and engineers. But they want, like you said before, it was just how do we keep the water away from our lovely development, the excess water that we've just put in, and not think about long term impacts, um, you know, over time. Perfect. I mean, that's an incredible um, news story. And I'm really glad we picked up and spoken about it because it could have a major impact on suds going forward, um, especially like kind of next year and beyond and kind of the developments that we'll see. <laughs> so really glad we <coughs> spoke about that, Lisa. Um, and that's it for our, my favorite new topic um, in the news. Um, I'm sure um, that is fast becoming Lisa's favorite uh, new topic as well. Absolutely. I knew it was a great idea. But anyway, now it's time to uh, go to the FAQ section of today's um, uh, saw motor school live so any questions that have come in uh during today's live session we'll make sure we'll answer and put to Lisa right away so the first question that's come in uh today how do you maintain an attenuation tank um well the ma the maintenance on the attenuation tank depends on the types they say there's well i mean there's many different types but we'll put them into the two main categories for the purpose of this of inspectable and non-inspectable um so a non-inspectable attenuation tank um, or any attenuation tank, both types should have a very good silt trap um, sized appropriately um, immediately at all the inlets. Some tanks have one inlet, some have multiple inlets, but every inlet should have a silt trap, which is essentially going to put, um, you know, trap any silt, debris, leaves and everything that are before they reach the tank um, or as much as possible. So they're not full proof, especially so during very large storm events. Uh, but the maintenance of a non-inspectable attenuation tank would generally be very regular cleaning of the silt trap, uh, which would come under the facilities management or the drainage plan. The drainage plan, when it's put in place, uh, would essentially assign um, who that would be, whether it be the local authority, whether it's going to be a private maintenance company. So the, the silt trap should be cleaned um, certainly at, immediately uh, um, after, every very, after every large storm event where they will be particularly full and then essentially lose their property. If they're not cleaned then and they're full, then you know the next storm event means that the they would they wouldn't be able to serve a purpose so they should be cleaned after every storm event um, and also regularly um again depending on usually every about once a year absolute minimum but we would recommend certainly more than that that the silt trap should be cleaned out regularly prior to um um prior to storm events to make sure they form they form their purpose and immediately after any as well um inspectable attenuation tanks though have that extra layer um you know of of solving the problem so yes they will have a silt trap which must also be cleaned out regularly but they also um, have the ability for you to put a camera um, or a jet down inside the attenuation tank through usually an, a, a, some kind of inspection shaft to essentially see how see what the you know what your attenuation tank looks inside if it needs a clean in the jet 
um, you know, they would they would involve running a camera down the length of the inspectable crate system, um, obviously reviewing the footage and then putting a high power jet system um, through the tank to flush it out essentially, um, and you know, remove any debris that has somehow made its way inside. And again, that is recommended usually every three to five years that a full inspection is carried out. Um, and obviously, along with your regular silt trap maintenance. I think you've answered that very well, Lisa. Right, the next question that we have coming up. How does a soak, soak away tank work? I think we spoke about it briefly, but just in case people didn't catch it at the start. Yeah, no, I so said we did cover it a little bit. So basically, the tank works by... Um, Essentially, you know, the water will come into the tank faster than it makes its way out, as it does with all storage. It is a storage facility. Um, it's, it's a different type of storage shelter than an attenuation tank. But the, the water um, will run in via the, the inlets. could be once, it could be multiple inlets. Um, and, you know, the crate system surrounded with the textile will, will hold that water, essentially, um, and, you know, allow it to permeate through the sides and bottom of the system um, at a slower rate than what is entered in. So essentially it forms a kind of um, interim reservoir that will slowly um, allow the water to, 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 to make its own way through the sides and bottom of the tank, um, you know, and make its way back into the, the, the water table um, and the soil. Perfect. And then the next question we have coming up. Mm -hmm. How do I know what size attenuation tank I need? Um, well, if you are doing a development, you must consult a, a drainage engineer um, to, you know, because they will, it will, the size of the tank you need will depend on the full size design. Um, you know, the, the really simple answer is a calculation will be, will be, um, will be carried out, which will look at the, the area, which you're essentially building on or the catchment area. So essentially, how much, what square meterage area of grassland or, you know, free free earth am I paving over that will now be have this runoff water falling on top of it? It's going to look at the average rainfall in that area as well, um, you know, to see. So you can make a really pretty reasonable assumption of how much rain will fall in that area in the years going forward. And they also then put in what I would call a buffer or a, a storm return period, which will they will look at historical data as in, like, you know, what every so often we get these mega events. So are we going to look at this to design this for a, a one in a hundred year, you know, massive storm event or a one in two hundred year like massive storm event that doesn't happen all the time? Um typically in England and Wales, they look at a one hundred um one hundred year storm event, plus they add an additional forty percent one for climate change. Um and in, in Scotland it's actually a one in two hundred year storm event is typical. Um, and then they add on the extra 40 for climate change. So um, to summarise, the, the drainage engineer will look at the, the catchment area, the average rainfall, the storm return period, i.e. we're looking at a massive event that could happen one, every, once every 100 years. And then once you have that figure, add in an additional 40% to cover for, um, you know, because the earth is getting wetter and, um, you know, more climate change is exacerbating the issue. And so that really the attenuation tanks are sized properly um, because they have these big buffers um, and they're designed for these large events should never be overwhelmed. I mean, people can look at it to reduce the size of the attenuation tanks slightly by putting in things like rainwater harvesting systems beforehand to try and reuse some of the water so that would reduce the size of your um, potential attenuation tank. You did Lucy look at the amount of plants and things that they're putting in, which would reduce some of the water. So it is formed part of a sub design. Um, but the, the main the main um, calculation is based on those four um, four figures essentially, which will differ for every site. So I know two attenuation tanks are the same. Exactly, perfect. I think you've answered that very well, Lisa. And I think is that all the questions we've had come in? Yep, I've got the thumbs up uh, from the people in the studio. Um, so I believe that is it for today's Stormwater School Live session. Lisa, thank you for your time today. No, thank you, Cal. It's been great to be back. Do this again yeah, soon. It certainly has. Uh, the first stormwater school session of the year. Um, we'll be back next week, I uh, believe, for Rainwater Research Live. We'll have David in the hot seat to answer all your questions um, regarding rainwater harvesting. But in the meantime, have a great week. Lisa, have a great week too. You and too, we'll see you all on the next one. Thanks very much. Bye all. Cheers.